Climb milling with a ball screw. Is it bad? Well, let me be more specific. There. Is it bad? Well, I've heard something like a jillion people. Let me just zoom in on the skull here. I've heard so many people mention this on forums asking, you know, hey, is it cool to install ball screws on my bridge port so that I don't have uh, backlash? And some people go, yeah, I've done it on mine as long as you, you know it's there and don't just turn loose of the machine in climb mill and expect it to self-hold, which it won't. And in theory, they're right. Yeah, if, if it was totally frictionless system, uh, yeah, it will not self-hold. It should, it should take off and, and go on its own when you put it in climb mill. It won't, it's not like a self-locking uh, self screw that's in there now, that lead screw, that acne screw. <laughs> But a lot of people have said, well, you know, I've done it to my mill, and uh, if I just adjust the Gibbs a little bit, it works fine. Then I've heard other people say, oh, well, it, it'll break your arm, it'll break your wrist, it's extremely dangerous, it'll just rip out of your hand. And so I thought, okay, most of the people that say that don't say, hey, I've done that to my mill, and I have my arm in a cast because of it. But I felt like instead of taking that approach of just, well, this is what'll happen. I'm gonna offer you no proof except I've been machining a million years and that should be enough. Well, that's that's not enough for me. I, where I come from, we like to use numbers to prove what we're saying or else uh, I'll get laughed at and fired. So that brings me to my next exhibit. Let's clarify what Klein milling and conventional milling are. What are the differences? What are they? Hang on, let me get my pen here to hold my Oh, my paper from going away. So I see all the time on some videos and these guys are like, okay, climb milling and they're like turning their finger and squinting out in the space and trying to remember. This is way easier. Just remember it this way. If, say you were working and you didn't have your workpiece tied down at all, or let's say the mill could move in whatever direction it wanted to. If it, if it is being engaged and move along the piece where if you turned it loose, it would want to climb along the workpiece as it makes its cut, that's climb milling. Another thing about climb milling is that, uh, let me get that back. Here we go. Is in certain metals like titanium that are not very thermally conductive and the chip doesn't remove a lot of heat from the workpiece, it's better to climb mill because your cut starts out as when your tooth, let's say this is a fresh tooth coming in here, it's, it's been hit with coolant, it's cool. The biggest part of the cut will be right here will be at the initial point where the tooth is cool. And then as the tooth starts to warm up, the cut load goes down on it because it's finishing the cut. Okay. Conventional milling. What we do, what you grew up doing on a, on a bridge port usually. It goes against the grain. So the way this... Uh, end mill is spinning it would want to go this way roll that way but we're pushing it this way so the cut gradually gets heavier until it finally ends so basically the opposite of what we just discussed because with something like titanium you know you come in and your tooth here would be nice and cool and it starts the lightest part of its cut and it doesn't get big, the, the cutting load doesn't get large until the tooth has already gotten pretty hot. So that's a lot harder on your tooling. And not to mention, you're just gonna get a better finish with climb milling. Four, the part of it is because of the same reasons I just discussed here. So why would climb milling be bad? Well, if you're running on a frictionless ball screw that has no backlash, then you feasibly could end up with the mill climbing away from you and running away. So I wanted to go through and see, well, if that's the case, how is it strong enough? Can it turn that, that pulley out of my hand hard enough that it break my hand? So let's do a little math right quick. So let's just, for ease of calculation's sake, let's assume our ball screws contact point where the balls actually contact the threads are one inch apart, which is pretty close to what a normal ball screw is. Like, 28 or 30 millimeters or something. 
and that would mean that you know the balls don't contact on the dead tip of the threads they contact a portion of the way down so i'm just i am fibbing here a little bit but you'll see why once you see the number you'll see why it doesn't matter as much so we look here and we know uh, we'll say this is uh five threads per inch which is a pretty reasonable number uh i've read that a lot of places offer that that particular setup with a ball screw so it, we need to know our angle of these threads. Now you can look that up or you can calculate it. And I calculated the easiest way that I always remembered it in undergrad and that's pi D times your threads per inch. And uh, because my diameter is one inch, my life just got really easy. So it's just pi times one times five and that's 15.708 inches, which is, you know, in order to go one inch axially, we have to travel 15.708 inches along those threads. So that's why I multiply it times five because it's five threads per inch. So you see where we're going here. So we use some tangent, some trig, and we get our angle here. That's a really kind of a cockamimi arrow I'm drawing here, but you get the point. That angle is 3.643 degrees. And checking on it, we're within, you know, five or six hundredths of a degree here on this calculation, which once again, aren't gonna be that crucial to show you the answer. But this is very close to what numerical values say, and, and yes, that, that's right. That's what it would have to be. So anyway, moving right along. Say, I made our cutting force here pretty huge. Let's say that it's 2,000 pounds kicking that part back into you. So we've got our cutting force striking the thread here, and it has, once it hits this thread, most of the force will be directly into or perpendicular to the thread, but part of it will be transmitted tangentially. You understand how the, if you hit something that's at an angle, the steeper the angle is along your cut, then the more the force will go tangentially and the less of it will go perpendicular. But if you're hitting an, an angle that's much flatter like this, which is only 3.64 degrees, then it becomes much more perpendicular absorption versus being transmitted tangentially along the threads. So moving right along. So if we do this little bit of math, because you see I drew this triangle down here, this is that same 3.643 due to this being this angle. And if you remember geometry, I won't go back and explain that to you. So we have our main force, which is the hypotenuse of this little right force triangle we've drawn, and we want this one over here. So we need to use the sine of 3.643 degrees. I know a lot of professors that would knock off 10 points just for forgetting that little symbol. Times our force of our cut equals our F tangential along the thread. This is what we'll be trying to turn the threads, how hard the threads are trying to be turned. Your perpendicular force isn't turning anything. It's pushing directly 90 degrees to it. That ain't turning anything. But that that axial force, I mean, not the axial force, the uh, tangential force is going along the threads. That's what's trying to turn stuff. So anyway, back to it. We got 127.08 pounds force. I know a lot of guys want to just slam their fist and go, yeah, I knew it, it would break your wrist. No. No, it doesn't, no, no, not there yet. Give me a moment. Uh, let's get talking about moments. Okay, so that force is being transmitted up here. F, T. All right, and it's a half inch from the center. So we need to know how much torque that's generating because if it's going to twist your wrist off, it would have to be done by a torque. So, half an inch times that force, we get 63.54 inch pounds of torque. That's some great handwriting, isn't it? All right, so 
we got to counter that torque. We have to hold it and keep it from going anywhere. So pretend we're just holding the wheel to keep it from running away from us. Now, bear in mind, this is assuming that there is absolutely zero friction, which would mean that if I were to spin that wheel and walk away, it would never stop spinning. So apparently our bearings are made out of unobtainium. So I'm trying to make this the worst possible case. Of course, we know there would be some friction associated with the ball screw and some friction associated with the bearings, yada, yada, yada. There's grease in it. You know, it's not perfectly frictionless. But we're going to leave that alone and assume worst case scenario. Now, we need, I'm just going to assume the hand wheel, the grab point where you would grab your hand wheel to do this, about four inches from the central axis. So now we say that that torque here, M torque, and the arc of the hand wheel, so four inches, and then this is that torque that we calculated up here. That gives us an F counter to counter that, to hold that back, it's 15.88 pounds. So basically, if you were to try and hold that wheel and you had 2,000 pounds cutting force pushing back along the table and you're running a ball screw, you would have, and it was totally frictionless between there and your hand, you would get about 15.88 pounds. I don't know about you, but I can hold 15.88 pounds with my hand. It takes more than 15.88 pounds to turn a sticky mill. So I don't think that's gonna break your wrist. And to be honest with you, assuming that it's not frictionless, and if you think back, how much does it take, you know, to turn your mill? Is your mill super easy to turn? Is it not easy to turn? Even if you do have ball screws, you got a gib that's running along there. I believe what those guys are saying that say, I just adjusted my gibs and I was aware of it. I don't think that's going to break my wrist. Now, I don't know. You could be Mr. Glass. It might break your wrist. Or, I mean, if you're using a cob mill that's, you know, that big around and, you know, that tall and you're hogging, you know, 125,000, you know, a, a pass or, or more, then, you know, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you're rocking and rolling like what our Mazax and DMGs used to do at the other place I used to work, then maybe, you know, this would be a concern, but for what you normally would do with a bridge port, you know, I don't think you're gonna generate that much. But, you know, that's just me. I thought I would uh, try and clarify some stuff with some actual numbers because of all the times I've been on these machinist forums, I think I've maybe seen numbers twice, twice. But I thought I would be the guy to do it one more time.